The next thing we'd like to look at in seventh grade math is just a quick rational number operations review. So this will give you an opportunity to look at some quiz-like questions, some test-like questions that I realized we struggled with and give you a chance to maybe just practice and rehearse some of those things. So I'm going to toss this at you. I'll also give you a heads up. I plan on Thursday after school being here until 4 o'clock for any 7th grade math student that wants to stay. We'll just do a quick test prep. So again, Thursday, that's this Thursday, it's the 7th, until 4 o'clock. But you need a ride figured out, and I don't want you stranded here, because then that's not a cool thing. I don't have a way to get you home. Uh, so anyway, this is something we're going to use as a tool to kind of help us prepare for that. I know that not every student needs this. Again, if you have an A or B on your test, I'm giving you the option not to work on this review. So if you don't want to work on this review with the whole group, um, you have a couple options. You could work on this review in partners because you've proven your independence. It will be challenging, I would think, somewhat. But again, you would be able to handle that with another student that earned an A or B on their test. So that's one option. The other option here is to work on brain at work. So again, this is only for my students that earned an A or B on that test, that extremely challenging test. I understand it was a tough one. So this is only if you're up for the challenge, right? Um, the rest of us, we're going to continue working on that review. So talk with the guest teacher. This brain at work is available. Um, I want you to do some good thinking through these problems, which really involve primarily integers. So it's really a flashback maybe to one of our first lessons in chapter two. There is an answer key where you can do some checking when you believe you're done or ready, or if you really get stuck and need to take a peek. You can speak with the guest teacher about that. Next up. Either the guest teacher is going to feel comfortable with letting you work as table partners. Those of us who didn't do so hot on the test, we need some time to practice and to talk together. We want to do some review and some learning. So those things that were tough, we can either work on as partners if the guest, teacher's de guest teacher suggests so. Uh, if the guest teacher prefers and says, no, let's just go through this together. Sounds like there are a lot of questions out there. Well, then that's fine too. Then you can just go ahead and continue this video with me and we'll just take notes together. So your name, you are red hour, and your date should be at the top. And let's go ahead and tackle these. We'll just go in order for today. If you take a look, this first one is a mix of decimals with lots of operations and a fraction. And this is very much like one of the test questions that we saw. And I'll just give you a quick reminder. I was going to write this earlier and I forgot. Quiz is planned for currently Friday. Again, with that half day-ish, who knows? If we're having core, it'll be great. If we're not, it might get bumped. Well, if we take a look, I have a lot of different operations to consider. So I'm going to think of PEMDAS or GEMDAS. Are there parentheses? Sure are, but if you notice, there's nothing inside to be done. So next I'd look for exponents, but I don't see any. So next I'd consider multiplication or division in order from left to right. And I actually see a couple multiplications. There's one sitting here, and there's also one sitting here. Well, let's see what happens with us. See if we can get ourselves going in that direction. Um, before I do, I notice this fraction is kind of irritating me, so let's go ahead and take m over n and turn it into a decimal. That'd be the logical thing. There's only one fraction. Make it a decimal. Well, 9 goes into 4 0 times, so I'll bring my decimal up and say, well, 9 goes into 40. Let's see here. Well, 4 times, because 4 times 9 is 36. This is awesome. We're heading to decimal land. This should go really well, right? And when you subtract, you're left with 4. You bring down the next place value and you say 9 goes into 40 four more times. Because 4 times 9 is still 36. Excellent. And we subtract and regroup and we're left with 4 again. I notice 4 is smaller than my divisor. Things are going great. Bring down the 0. And 9 goes into 40, you guessed it, four times. I'm noticing something. We have not learned yet in 7th grade math how to deal with this repeating decimal. But I notice this repeat. We know how to show it with bar notation, of course, right? Dot, dot, dot is how it would continue. So I would just write 0 and 4 tenths with bar notation, repeating. But that's not super helpful over here. In fact, it's inaccurate. Unless I do some rounding or something and kind of plug it back in, I'm not going to be exact or precise until I learn the skill of turning these repeating decimals into um, a fraction or um, into a, another game plan. So with that, I think I need to kind of ditch this idea. That didn't work wasn't super helpful. There must be something else we can try. Well, if you remember, in our practice, no, in our actual test, we just talked about one that was kind of similar. In a minute, I bet we could take this negative 4 ninths and just see if I could multiply times this 27 tenths and see what happens. In fact, we could try that now and see if that might be a strategy to try. 
negative 4 ninths times, it's 2 and 7 tenths, but really that's the same as 27 tenths. If you can't see it this way yet, you could write a mixed number first and then multiply, add, and keep, but this would work. I noticed something, and it's probably rigged. Mrs. Schumann did this on purpose for you just so that you could see the strategy happen again. It will be true probably on the quiz also, um, so this is one option. See if that 9 and 27 will cross simplify, and they do. They both divide by 3 is nice, but 9 is better. 9 goes into 9 one time, and 9 goes into 27 three times. I could cross simplify these guys, this 4 and this 10, but I absolutely don't want to because 10 is a friendly denominator for decimals. I'm going to try to leave that alone. Let's see what I'd get. Negative 4 times 3 is actually negative 12, and 1 times 10 is 10. Negative 12 tenths. Could we write that as a decimal? Oh, we absolutely could. Let me go ahead and do that. I know we usually would start going from left to right, but I wanted to be sure this thing would quickly turn into either a decimal or we'd have another way to work with it where I could turn all of these numbers into mixed numbers or fractions. This strategy worked. So to write negative 12 tenths, I need that 12 to land in the tenths place. There it is. All right, I better go back and deal with this piece that I haven't touched. Well, uh, 8 tenths times 64, 6 and 4 tenths, I should say. I'm not sure I made this paper big enough. I'm going to take the 6 and 4 tenths and stack it on top. And I'm trying not to ruin my pizza, so off to the side here I'm showing you 8 tenths. And I'm going to multiply. 8 times 4 is 32, and I'll regroup the 3. 8 times 6 is 48, and I need to add 3 more. 49, 50, 51. Looks like I get 512, or do I? Do you remember that there are decimals involved here? Do you remember that decimal bank? I try to figure out how many times they divided the problem by 10. Well, they divided the first number by 10 once, and this next number is divided by 10 once. That's a total of two divisions. They divided by 10 twice. So I need to make two jumps in my final answer, or divide by 100. Looks like I'm going to get an answer of 5 and 12 hundredths here. We need to bring down everything else we have not dealt with. And the only reason why I could switch the order on here, I wanted to see if this thing would work out. And notice, it's separated by an operator of addition. So these are actually separate terms. So it didn't impact, really, um, me jumping out of order just to test that. We did okay on this one. I wouldn't always advise it, but it was okay this time. All right. Well, next I'm left with addition subtraction, and I get to go in order from left to right. So I'm going to start here. We're starting on the left and moving to the right. I could change a minus to a plus, change the sign of next if I like. And in fact, uh, now I have different signs. I'm going to need to subtract. We line up our decimals and apply what we've learned in integer rules. Well, 3 take away 2 is 1. 5 take away 1 is 4. You get to bring a decimal down. In addition subtraction, decimals come straight down. And 5 take away 5 is 0, and 1 take away nothing is 1. Looks like I get 10 and 41 hundredths. But be careful. Is this positive or negative? Hmm, what were there more of? Who was the farther number? Definitely there were more, more positives than negatives. Let's make it a positive 10 and 41 hundredths. Let's bring down everything else we haven't dealt with, like this negative 1 and 2 tenths. Well, right here, I notice I have the same rule happening again. Positives plus negatives makes different signs subtract. So I'll try not to ruin my pizza here. I'm going to stack the larger, and actually I shouldn't say that, the farther number on top. And I'm going to make sure I align my decimals. And I might need a placeholder in here to be able to show this. 1 take away 0 is 1. 4 take away 2 is 2. And your decimal moves straight down into your difference. Well, 10 take away 1 is actually 9. And you could do a regroup to show that if you like. Looks like I get an answer of 9 and 21 hundredths. Now, would this one be positive or negative? Go back a step and decide who's the farther number. There were more positives than negatives? Final answer. This is not the only way of solving this problem, but I actually think that this is a good strategy. When this 9 and this, in this case, um, this 2 and 7 tenths will cross simplify. It did. It helped. Next, number 2. This is something like what we saw in our test recently, and what I noticed is a lot of us like to change the order. On the test, you notice that there was a mixed number in the denominator, so you all wanted to switch the order. Well, not all of you, but several of us wanted to switch the order. We have to be careful about that. This always means numerator divided by denominator. If I were to rewrite this, I would show you this. A negative 3 and 7 twelfths. So notice that negative is just saying, hey, this whole quantity is negative on the numerator, and I'm going to divide by 5 ninths. Well, 
I have fraction division here, but before I can deal with it, lots of us forgot to include this whole number. Lots of us tried to leave it out, and then we ended up with some really strange things at the back that didn't make a lot of sense. But I notice I'm taking a negative 3 and 7 twelfths, and I'm splitting it into something less than 1. I should get quite a few of them. In fact, I should get more than 3 of them if things go well. So let's try this. 12 times 3 is actually 36, plus 7 more makes 41. No, sorry. Um, 6 and 7, 13. 43. So 36 plus 7 should get me 43. This is a negative quantity, so I'm going to show my negative in the numerator like I've shown you I like to do. And I'm going to put the 12 as my denominator. We actually use the skills of multiply, adding, and keeping MAC. Now I'm going to bring down this divide by 5 ninths just because I have the room to do so. And because sometimes when we use this improper fraction step, we kind of forget that we need to do a switcheroo in a second. We need to flip or show the reciprocal of the second term. So that's what we'll do now. I see some of us also flipping our first term. In division of fractions, it's always the first term that stays or we keep or we freeze. Next, we flip or change our operation to multiplication, and we have to show a reciprocal. So a reciprocal really means I'm flipping my numerator and denominator of the second fraction. If you want to show the freezer to remind yourself, the first fraction is always frozen, and it always comes from your numerator. In this complex fraction, the numerator is divided by the denominator. Well, let's see if there's any cross simplifying that might help me out. Oh good, there sure is. 12 and 9 both divide by 3. 3 goes into 9 3 times. 3 goes into 12 4 times. 43 doesn't look like much will go into that. In fact, it could be a prime number. So I don't think 5 will work for sure. It doesn't end in 5 or 0. I guess we're going to multiply across and see what happens. Well, 3 times 43, that'd be like a 120 plus 9 more, 129. And 4 times 5 gets us 20. Now I noticed something, and I kind of did it intentionally, because I see a lot of you doing this. You got caught up in the cross-simplifying, or the freeze-change-flip, or the multiply-by-the-reciprocal approach, and we dropped something. Look at the very beginning. We had a negative on the top, and a negative, I'm sorry, and a positive on the bottom. It's not like the test where we had two negatives. So these actually disagree. If they disagree, I know as I move along, what type of answer should I get? Negative. Now this isn't the final answer. This is uh, simplest form, m over n, so it's not bad. But I would also say we could write it as a mixed number because notice we started with a mixed number even in the original problem. So this would probably be better as a mixed number. Well, how many 20s go into 129? Should be six of them. So I'm thinking I'm going to get six groups. If I took away 120 little pieces, I'd be left with nine of those twentieths. Looks like we would get negative six and nine twentieths. We're going to keep on rolling here. Um, let's see if we can flip to problem number three, something else that appeared on the test, and it involves decimals. So decimals are considered rational numbers. The problem that we had was we're great at dividing, but we're not sure about where that decimal should move to. So before I even get this started, I know that the first number I am given becomes my dividend. Let's hope I spell that correctly for you. <laughs> the next number I'm given really becomes my divisor. Maybe you could even picture this in fraction form. The top number always dives in. So we want to set that up right now. 3 and 75 hundredths. I purposely took off this negative. It's kind of tough for me to see it inside my division symbol. I don't know about you, but I noticed something. Negatives divided by negatives, I'm going to get a positive answer. So I might even write a note for myself in a minute. Pay attention. Positive answer. Well, let me show this divisor then. And I'm going to drop the negative because, again, I'm already thinking ahead. Positive answer coming my way. I do not like to divide by anything with fractional pieces because the parts over here really don't match. They're not the same size units. And it's hard to make um, groups into 5 tenths, right? So what we're going to do is turn this into 25. How did I do that? Remember, we can multiply a divisor by 10, but if I choose to do that, to move that decimal and make it a whole number, I must do the same thing to the divisor. We were great about moving it out of our divisor, but we forgot to do it to our dividend. I think I just used the wrong word a second ago, but this is the dividend in here. Remember, your decimal gets to move straight into your quotient, we're ready to divide. 25 doesn't go into 3, but it goes into 37 one time. So we'll subtract. And I'll be honest, when I'm looking at this, I'm starting to be bothered by all those decimals in that movement. So I'm going to do a rewrite step. It's just going to help me out here in the long run, make sure things are a little more organized. All right, we said 25 doesn't go into 3, but it does go into 37 once. 
I subtract 25 and I'm left with 12. Uh, next up, 12 is smaller than my divisor, so I'm good. I'll bring down the next digit. 25 does go into 125. It's just like quarters. It takes four quarters to get 100 cents, so it should take five quarters to get 125. Indeed it does. Looks like I will get a final answer. It's a one and five tenths. And notice that decimal's already placed for me. You don't want to do any decimal banking in this situation. We don't really want to think about jumps in this one, I don't think, unless you were to consider your divisor and always make it a whole number before you decide how many jumps in your dividend. So, final answer. Remember, I can go back and double check my signs. They both agree. It's a positive. I think with the random problems I gave out, gave out today, it looks like I came up with a lot of positive answers. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> number four. Here we've got this fish tank, and this reminds me of one of the problems that we had to, uh, today on our test, or that we looked at today on the test, and it's really talking about that conversion, because if I even do a quick skim, I have gallons, and in a minute, they're going to change it to quarts. That's going to be tough to compare, unless we get the same size units. So I have this fish tank. It can hold 50 and a half gallons of water when it is full. A three-quart pitcher is used to fill the fish tank. How many pitchers of water are needed to fill the fish tank? Okay, fish tank coming up. And I know this fish tank holds, oops, I wrote that wrong, 50 and a half gallons. So here's my little 3D fish tank. The fish probably needs some bubbles. Okay. And I'm going to use a pitcher of some sort, so I don't know really how to draw that for you right now. Um, but it's going to have a spout or something, and it's going to pour some water in here, isn't it? And this holds three quarts. So I'm going to label it. I'm just trying to visualize. Sometimes visualizing helps you figure out what you should do. It's kind of like I could even move the other way. If I wanted to dump this tank with my three-quart pitcher, I could probably scoop it out and take it out repeatedly. That's kind of like division, isn't it? Um, so in this case, I'm taking my 50 and a half gallons and I want to divide by three quarts. I could go ahead and set that up for you. But I have to use my labels for a quick minute because they don't match yet. This is where conversion really comes in handy, and I hope you remember Gallon Man from the elementary. So I'm going to show you the giant Gallon Man, the giant G for Gallon. Well, if you remember, the next step down from gallons in our customary system, which by the way, the United States seems to love, but other countries don't, uh, we can break it down into quarts next. If you remember, there are how many quarts in a gallon? The answer is four. And I could keep on going down to pints and cups and ounces for you, but we don't need to for this problem. We're just going from our giant gallons to a smaller quart size. Well, if you notice, it takes four of these quarts to make one gallon. So, wouldn't I need several of those to make 50 and a half gallons? I would. I'm really going to multiply this by four quarts each. Four quarts in each gallon. I'm not sure that I'm lining this up very well for you, but I'm going to try to do this conversion here. Well, I know 4 times 50 is 200, and 4 times 1 half is 2, so it looks like I need 202 gallons. And I'm going to be dividing, oops, darn it, it's not gallons anymore, is it? I need 202 quarts, and I need to divide by 3 quarts, and see how many times it's going to take to do that. Well, you were allowed to use calculators on the test. You probably don't need them today. I think we could probably just do a long division because I made the numbers pretty nice. 3 doesn't go into 2, but it does go into 20 six times. And when you subtract 18, you're left with 2. 2 is smaller than your divisor, so we'll keep on going. And 3 goes into 22 hmm, seven times. Because 7 times 3 is 21, we can subtract to be left with 1. I really could keep on going to try going to decimal land, but if you notice, I probably don't want to. This is why I say that. What kind of number were we given to start with? Either mixed numbers or whole numbers. And right now, I could move into a mixed number format. Looks like it could take me 67 and one third. 67 and one third what? Chihuahuas, fish, bubbles, tanks? Let's go back to the question. How many pitchers of water? It's going to take 67 and a third pitchers of water to fill that fish tank. Next up, we really had a hard time with Bill and his account, didn't we? Well, actually, it wasn't Bill in the test. I think it was Josh. Was it Josh in his test? I don't remember. Someone had an account in the test, and they had some balance, or they bought some stock. And this is kind of similar to that problem, so I just kind of came up with something that I thought would get us thinking along the same line, so that you're prepared for anything that could happen on that quiz on Friday. Bill had $74 in his savings account. 
During two weeks, he paid $25.99 for a birthday present. Sounds like a good deal. Then he deposited a dollar, $150 the next day. He bought lunch for $8.50 each day for a week. On the last day, he donated $25 to the Rockin' Hawks. I wonder what that is. Maybe a music group. How much will Bill's bank account change in the two weeks? So first they're asking me to find the account change for the two weeks. Part B says, what will Bill's savings account balance be at the end of the two weeks? So next I'm looking for savings account balance. If you look, there's a little different setup down here. It says I get to show my work in the savings register and I notice something. I'm going to include a date, what happens, a withdrawal or a deposit, and it says right here his current balance is $75. Oh, that's just, I wrote that wrong too. So now we're really in trouble. You're going to have to change this for me because I made all of your copies already. Bill had $74, so sorry Bill, we already have to take a dollar away from you. So maybe we're going to call this an adjustment. Sometimes that happens. Or balancing with the bank. And I don't know what date we'll call this. Well, actually you're working on this tomorrow, which is 12-4. And what are we going to do? Are we going to take away or add that dollar back? Well, we're going to take it away because he doesn't have $75. He only has 74 so something I like to do sometimes on top of this is show you withdrawals get a negative and deposits get a positive. I'll also show you this. The whole dollars get to go in front of this bar or this line and our decimal piece or our change or our cents gets to go behind. The hundreds place, are showing, the hundreds place is showing behind this. All right, so we've done our adjustment quite by accident. I didn't know we had to do that. So uh, next up, let's go and dig into the two weeks that we have to look at. It says, Bill had paid $25.99 for a birthday present. So we don't exactly know the date. I didn't do a really great job of that. So we'll just back up a little bit and um, I don't have an answer for you here. We should have given that a date. So we won't right now. We'll just say, gosh, it didn't include it. But we could describe it's a birthday present. And I'll be honest, I think some people are really good about using their check registers and saving registers, maybe using their darks and their lights to indicate either just a withdrawal or a deposit. They actually separate it by kind of a color coding. Um, I'm not worried about that for you today. I'm just worried that you give me a good description of what's happening. Hey, if I'm buying a birthday present, am I gaining or losing money? Sounds like I'm losing money. And if I go back, it looks like I lost or withdrew $25.99. So I'm going to have to subtract that from $74. Well, 74 take away 25. That seems like it would get me $49. But I have to take away 99 cents from that. So, hmm. $49 take away 90 cents. Is that the same as $48 plus one? And so I'd still have $48 left, but this $1 I'd take away 99 cents from it and be left with what? Hmm, looks like a penny. So you could really do the stacking, you could say. Um, $74 with the decimal and line up $25.99 and do a little bit of regrouping here. But it looks to me like we're going to be left with one cent and $48. All right, birthday present accounted for. I should have thought to put dates in here, but I didn't, so that's okay. Next, he makes a deposit. How much money did he make that day? $150. So the next day, whatever it is, so we should really have a date. We're just going to write down today that he has a deposit. So we're going to make this table work even though it's not the best idea. Just something different to organize our work. So notice I put the $150 in my deposit. It's being added on. It's a positive thing. So I can mentally add 150 to 4801 and I'm going to get 19801. Looks pretty good. And if you want to check it off to the side, you can just don't write it in the middle of your savings register. All right. Deposit check. Now he's buying lunch, but be careful. He buys this lunch for each day of a week. So this is kind of important. He's doing that for how many days? Well, a week is seven days. So I'm going to take eight and five tenths times seven. Notice I did drop the zero and I'm okay with that. I'll get it back in there in a second if I need to, to show money. Seven times five is 35. I'll regroup the three. Seven times eight is 56. Plus three more makes 59. Remember your decimal bank. That's really why they threw this problem at you on the test. Did you remember where the decimal goes? Well, it looks like we need to jump only one place in our final answer. Oh yeah, that doesn't look like money at all. So we would put a zero behind it as a placeholder. $59.50 looks better. Now remember, he's buying lunch. So will that be a withdrawal or a deposit? Well, he has to pay for it. His account is going to feel the pain. So $59.50, that added up quickly, Bill. 
and I'm going to write lunches. And we don't know the dates, but we know it lasted for a week. Off to the side now, I need to really figure out his account balance, so how would I do that? I would take what's currently in his account, and I'd have to take away his withdrawal, or this money that he paid for his lunches. So, 198.01, and I'm taking away 59 and 50 cents. It's critical that we put the larger number on top in the situation to do our subtraction. And we have some regrouping that will happen along the way. Seven take away nine it won't happen without another regroup. But 17 take away nine can. Eight take away five is three. Bill, you're down to 138.51. We're keeping a balance as we go. So lunches, check. The last thing, it says on the last day he dealt with the Rock and Hawks. He gave a donation for $25. So the last thing we should see here from him is a date, of course, which I don't have for you, and we'll tell you who he gave it to. Rockin Hawks, oops, donation, and we will quickly say that's $25. Well, was that a withdrawal or a deposit? It came out of his account. He gave it to someone else. It's a withdrawal. That's another negative. Lots of negatives for him today. So we have this 138.51, and I'm going to subtract from it. Notice I don't want to write that subtraction right here because that would make me a mathematical liar with this equation bar. So we're going to do a rewrite step. So let me move here towards the bottom and see if we can do that. I have 138.51, and I want to take away $25. Well, not much regrouping on this one. Bill? Looks like we find your balance. All right, so have I answered the questions up above? Because I did everything that it mentioned in the story problem. How much will Bill's bank account change in the two weeks? Well, this is an interesting way to look at it. I would really have to compare my withdrawals and add my deposit to it and do a comparison of the negatives to the positives. Or couldn't I also do this? Do we see how we started with $74? Should have been $74 in the beginning, if you remember. And he ended with $113.51. Did it go up or down? Well, it's definitely increasing, but we want to know by how much. How much did the account go up? So to do that, I have to find the difference. And I'm not sure we figured that out anywhere on here yet, so I'm actually going to write that down. Actually, it could go up by the problem. That'd probably make better sense. So let's see if we have room for it up here. 113.51, it was his final balance, and I'm going to take away his original balance, which sort of read $74. This is what you get when you're moving quickly, because you want to be at the hospital with your mom the next day. Here we go. One takeaway zero is one. Five takeaway zero is five. And we get to line up and bring down that decimal. Three takeaway four won't happen without a little regroup here, so 13 takeaway four is nine. We're going to do another regroup to make sure I can do 10 takeaway seven, which is three. Wow. Bill, it looks like your account did change, $39.51. But when I talk about this change, is it positive or negative? Remember, his account started out lower than it ended, so it increased. So I might write here increase, I might write something like gain. I definitely have to make sure that I'm showing this as a positive thing. All right, Bill, what's your savings account balance at the end of the two weeks? Well, that's something I've already figured. At the end of the two weeks, I kept your balance all the way along, Bill. And I noticed this is where we landed. So I have my work to prove it. I just used a different organization, kind of this table idea for you, because I think we're having some trouble kind of setting up an expression to kind of simplify. And I thought this might be a good approach. I should have remembered some dates. I agree. Well, do we need to say anything more about this? Maybe we could just write balance or savings balance. Or maybe you want to write a really fancy sentence because you're that awesome. All right. The last thing I want to look at is a scuba diver. So this would be the grand finale. And uh, let's see if we can figure out what's happening here. A scuba diver starts four meters above sea level before plunging 31 meters down. She descends 55 meters before ascending at a rate of three meters per minute for eight minutes. Find the final depth of the diver. I really got carried away here. I really want to make sure that you guys use this to study. I wrote that like five times at the bottom. Anyway. Let's see if I can visualize this. So I need a scuba diver. Don't ask me how to draw that. But here we go. Scuba diver. You need a tank on your back. You, of course, need a snorkel, I think. Probably a mask of some sort. I don't really know how that works. Your scuba gear. And I can probably only see your eyes. Uh, what else would you have? Flippers, of course. They're probably called something. More like, I don't know what, scuba shoes. Next up. 
this scuba diver starts here and they're at four meters above sea level. When you talk sea level, I really am talking about a vertical number line. So I might put a little mark here and show this is four meters. Well, what happened next? Four meters is accounted for. Plunging, what does plunging mean? 31 meters down. Well, where do we hope our scuba diver is heading? Should they be in the air? Should they start floating up? No, probably not. They're heading into the water and usually they do a back dive to do that. But they're moving 31 meters down. Well, I don't know what location that is. I kind of need to figure it out. So if you notice, uh, I'm taking away more than I had. It looks like I'm going to be crossing my BFF zero, the sea level mark. He's going to definitely, or she, is going to dive below zero. Because if we take four away, she'd be at zero or at sea level. But we're going to take away more than that. She's probably jumping off or um, diving in off of a boat or something, maybe a deck. So what does 31 take away four? The answer would be 27. But notice it can't be a positive 27 because that would mean my scuba diver is then floating. And I don't want that. Um, the bubbles can float, but not the diver. So this must be negative 27 below sea level. That's all set. She descends. This word descends. We didn't like that a lot in the test. We had questions about it. Descending. Well, our choices are ascending or descending. D is really t meaning taking away. So I'm going to descend 55 meters. She's heading down 55 meters more. That's a distance, and I'm not sure where she's going to land, but I bet I could figure it out. So here I have a negative 27 plus a negative 55. Hmm, this is the same signs add and keep, really. So I could also think about distance in this situation, I suppose. It looks like I'm going to get a negative 83. Negative 83 meters. I don't really know if scuba divers can go that low, so please don't try this at home. Next it says that she ascended. Oh, there's the opposite of descending, ascending. Ascending means going up, descending means going down. She's ascending at a rate of three meters per minute for eight minutes. Whoa, this is happening for how many minutes? Eight of them. She's moving up three meters, three meters, three meters, three meters, three meters, eight times. So I don't know how many times I tried that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't know if she's really going to land above sea level. My arrows kind of made it look that way. But this is 3 meters times 8 minutes. She's really moving up 24 meters from that point. Let's see if we can put this in a giant expression and see if we can make it work. So I just have my visual happening over here. Let's see if we can make it a string of an expression that we can simplify. 4 meters is positive, but you take away 31 because you're plunging. Oh, you descend more. You take away 55 because you're going down. You ascend, you're ascending, you're going up, but you're going up, which means positive, and you're moving not just three meters, but three meters per minute for eight minutes. You're doing that eight times, so I'm going to multiply by eight. I think I have all the pieces included. 55 meters, heading down, three meters per minute for eight minutes, heading up. So notice this is a positive at the back, I'm adding that on. Let's see if we can find the final depth of the diver. We're going to try pizza style. So um, if we take a look, the first step would be probably change a minus to a plus, change this item next. Different sign subtract. And 4 plus a negative 31 is a negative 27. We'd bring down everything else we have not dealt with and see what we could do next. I'm really solving addition and subtraction in order from left to right. Oops, but I'm not sure I should have. Because when I look at the very back, what do you notice? what's over here that I probably should have done first. It won't impact the problem because it's separated by some other operators, but what should we really have done? Multiplication. So I'll fix that on this level. Here we go. So hopefully you saw that before I did. This would be more ideal. 4 plus a negative 31. Take away 55 plus 24. This really should have been my first move. Why don't we just finish it from here? So here we go. We said we'll get a negative 27. We'll take away 55 and add 24 on. Well, taking the first two terms, I could change a minus to a plus and change the sign of next or add the opposite. I'll get a negative 82 plus a positive 24. Here I have different signs subtract, so I might need to do some stacking here. Or I could say 82, take away 22 would leave me 60, but I need to take away two more. So I'm going to get 58. Would this be positive or negative? Well, we kind of hope that that diver isn't floating. Their bubbles can float, but I hope they don't. 
because they're a scuba diver, they like it under the water. Notice my negative number is farther away from zero. Looks like I'm going to get a negative 58. I believe the final answer is negative 58 meters. And you could talk about that's the final depth of the diver, but the idea is that they would be underwater yet. Looks like when they started getting these jumps back, I should have stopped somewhere between negative 27 and negative 83. That makes sense because 24 jumps would move me somewhere between there. All right, let's see. Oh, that actually ends our assignment. If you pay attention to the directions at the very bottom, I think I got better as time went on. It says this assignment will be graded on our next block day. So that means for you, I should see you on Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay, so I'm looking for this on Wednesday to give you credit. Um, so make sure that you have it done. If you didn't finish it in class, I hope you're watching my video at home to fix it up and to get ready for the quiz. And you want to save it and study it. Please don't turn it in early today. I want you to save it and study it. Bring it to me on Wednesday so we can take a look and take any questions you have. There is something on this review that I did not discuss and it probably is fair game for the quiz. It's range. So something else just to consider. I'll see if I can make you some other um, practice problems and videos if we need them. But for now, um, let's focus on these and see if we can get going in the right direction. So use this as a study tool. It is due Wednesday.